So welcome everybody, I'm Gwen McCoslin. I'm the director of the South Dakota Agricultural Heritage Museum. And first, I want to acknowledge the land that the South Dakota State University occupies across South Dakota is the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Ochecte Shakawi, meaning seven council fires, which is the proper name for the people referred to as Sioux. We acknowledge that before these sites were named South Dakota State University, they were called home by people of American Indian nations indigenous to this region. We also thank the South Dakota Humanities Council for grant funding that partially funded this program and our exhibit. Today we have Chuck Bolin presenting the Long Depression, South Dakota's experience in the 1920s and 1930s. Dr. Volan is currently an Associate Professor of History here at SDSU as part of the School of American and Global Studies, where he teaches several classes covering U.S. history to the Great Depression, history and culture of the American Indian, and historical methods and historiography. His academic interests and areas of expertise are in American Western expansion, Native American history, social history, and prohibition history. Please help me welcome Dr. Chuck Bolin. All right. Uh, can you hear me well enough? No, not yet. All right. Well, I'll see what I can do. I'm not so, used to a microphone. So All right. There we go. Well, hi. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to talk about today is what I call the Long Depression. I don't think you can really understand South Dakota or really rural America's uh, experience in the Depression without going back to the 1920s. And for the vast majority of people, if you, you know, if you talk about uh, the Depression, they are going to immediately think 1929 forward. But I would argue that in rural America, the Depression really began uh, like turning a light switch in the fall of 1920. And it, uh, it's going to be an especially hard fall because it came after a period of, of real uh, you know, uh, rural prosperity. Uh, really, uh, the last third or so of the 19th century is a tough time to be a farmer. We've got a, a worldwide it's a situation called the Great Deflation. Uh, there are all kinds of internal problems. We've got droughts. Uh, but things began to turn around around 1898, and prices rose, the rains came back again, and we're going to see farmers just really enjoying tremendous prosperity. And while they're doing that, they're becoming more productive. They're going from horsepower to steam power. Uh, and uh, they're, they're certainly opening up more land for farming. And so we've got this great period of pr high prices. And then World War I began. Of course, it begins in, in Europe first, 1914. And with the beginning of that war, we're going to see uh, markets really open up for American farmers because Europeans were busy slaughtering each other in what used to be farm fields. And so prices grew uh, you know, to really high levels, and farmers were really in, you know, enjoying incredible prosperity. And when the United States joined the war uh, in 1917, all of uh, those things got even better for Americans. Uh, for one, uh, we're going to see a real tremendous desire by Europeans to, uh, they needed more horses. And so they're going to come to uh, places like South Dakota and they're going to put these ads out saying, here what we want for horses. This is really a horse war. And farmers are going to be quite happy to give up horses because it takes about five acres to grow the feed for a horse. And of course, uh, if I don't you know, use that horse, I've still got to feed it every day. I can't just ignore it out there in the barn. And so farmers are going to start to mechanize with that money that they're, or to, excuse me, to buy tractors with that money that they were getting for, for horses. Now, uh, maybe even more importantly, we want to think about the role of the federal government here. The, the federal government very much wanted farmers to produce everything they could. And so Congress passed the 1917 Lever F uh, Food and Fuel Control Act uh, with the goal of encouraging production. And so the federal government is going to set very high minimum prices for uh, agricultural products. And it's going to direct farmers to uh, plow to the fence for national defense. They say, if you can't fight farm, wheat will win the war. And as a result of these amazing high prices, right, farmers are going to open up land that they, they would have considered marginal before that, or sub-marginal. And uh, certainly here in South Dakota, they're going to farm further west than ever. And farmers are becoming more and more efficient as they go along, thanks to mechanization. I mean, look at these prices. Uh, would farmers be happy to get $27 a bushel for corn today? Anybody know what corn is going for today? 
I figure this is a good crowd. Okay, so, hmm, yeah, pretty good years, right? It makes good sense that farmers would expand, and they're going to do that in this whole era because they've got about 20 years of real prosperity. The only way to really expand to make more money is to buy more land, to buy more equipment. But what does that lead to? Debt. How much, how many bushels per acre were they raising back then? Okay, so it's, yeah, and I, I, to be honest, I couldn't do it off memory, but it's a lot less than today, for sure. Um, yeah, our, the, uh, you know, synthetic fertilizers have really made a big difference. So uh, during the war, virtually all inputs are going to go up in price, uh, law, supply, and demand, and we can certainly see what happens to land prices. Right. And again, farmers are going to be willing to make the gamble that this successful period is going to go on further and further. Uh, but that's really, unfortunately, not going to be the, the case. As you can see, we've got more and more farms. They're growing larger in size. Right. Uh, that's going to change shortly here. Uh, there was a real sense that, uh, in all likelihood, this prosperity is going to continue for a long time. But it came to a real crashing halt uh, in really the fall of 1920. For one, uh, it turns out Europeans were a lot faster to start growing again than people expected. Uh, the Russians in particular are going to be selling a lot of grain, competing with the Venezuelans, for example, as well. Um, we also see a real big change when in 1920, uh, Woodrow Wilson, the president, issued an executive order that ended the price supports on the Lever Food and Fuel Control Act. And so now prices are really going to be actually following the markets. Right? And at the same time, the nation went through a credit crunch. Uh, there literally wasn't enough credit to, uh, to uh, distribute among farmers. And if, if there were getting loans, they're going to be at a very high rate. And uh, like I said, it's like turning a light switch. Uh, the economy just collapsed. So here's our state uh, historian, Doan Robinson, writing about uh, the greatest, he, he did a yearly report, right? The matter of the greatest note in South Dakota for the year 1920 has been the great break in the prices of farm products brought about by, he, as he put it, the arbitrary restriction of credits. Well, there are a whole lot of, a whole lot of problems. Uh, production wasn't one of them, right? With granaries bursting with plenteous abundance, the producers are unable to realize means to reward labor, pay debts, or purchase needed merchandise. Uh, we're going to be in for some tough times. Right. 20 years of high prices were over. And I, I can't say this uh, loudly enough or uh, enough in terms of <laughs> as many times as I can say it. Everybody in South Dakota would be hurting when farmers were hurting. South Dakota did not have uh, the same diversified economy that we have today. So if farmers are hurting, everybody was hurting because they weren't spending money. So as you can see from Governor William McMaster here, right, this depressing influence has been felt throughout every line of business. And so those prices went down and farmers didn't think they could, uh, they could, they could possibly make it with these prices. Right, greater efficiency, remember, causes greater output. That's a long-term trend. Uh, farmers are always trying to uh, make small profit margins larger. Uh, prices are going to fall for really hard very quickly in 1920, and they're going to kind of slowly rise over the course of the decade. Uh, in 1926, farmers, uh, there was a real good study done in Lake uh, County, and farmers uh, talked about how they felt like there was some sort of combination of interests against them, and that just wasn't the case. And they were talking about it in this study about how they couldn't afford to live. Uh, corn was going for about 75 cents a bushel then. That's about $13 now. And they thought, we can't make it on $13. Now, hard times also came to the Oteti Shakaween. And a lot of folks don't know this, but uh, particularly among the Lakotas, West River, uh, their cattle ranches had been doing quite well. They've been raising a lot of cattle. Uh, they'd had such a successful cattle operation that when the federal government needed to purchase cows to repay them for the lands that the government had taken, they were buying these cows from the Sioux themselves. Uh, but then this is going to be uh, a short-lived industry. Uh, for one, uh, the U.S. took most of their lands in the allotment period. 
And then during World War I, cattle prices were so high that their superintendents told them, you need to sell every cow you have, including your breeding stock, and so much for that. And so the, increasingly, the, the Sioux of the state were dependent on uh, the leases that they got, the lease money they got from, from non-native farmers. And to give you an example, in 1926, the average income of an on-reservation on Yankton Sioux was $149. $77 of that came from land leases. $72 of that came from work. And uh, the situation's even more unbalanced in the West River reservations. So if we go to Standing Rock in 1926, the average yearly income was $167, and out of that, 112 came from uh, leases. And what we're gonna see is over the course of the 20s, their economy is also gonna decline. Now, uh, to think about really anybody involving uh, working in farming at this time, uh, let me ask, what would you do if you were a farmer and you were in debt badly? What would you do? Anybody feeling brave? You're gonna plant more, aren't you? It's the only thing you can do. Uh, and this is not going to help. For just in five years, from 1924 to 1929, the number of harvested acres in South Dakota went from about 16.4 million up to about 19 million acres. And again, a lot of these were really not suited for agriculture. And what they were doing was building up a, an environmental debt that's gonna come due in the 1930s. Now, uh, when we teach uh, American history and we talk about the Depression, one of the, the sort of ideas you're trying to get across is that this image that people have that the depression began, like, like turning a light switch, uh, with a great crash is not true. It actually took about, the economy took about three to four years to bottom out. And uh, what it really happened in 1929 with the great crash is that it shook people's confidence and it also showed underlying financial weaknesses. And one of the big ones was that the nation's <laughs> rural banking system was failing. And you can't think about banks the way like we would think about say Wells Fargo. A lot of these banks are tiny. It's a business like any other local business. Hi, I'm Chuck, this is my bank. Hope it works for you. Right? They don't have a lot of assets to back them up. And farmers were failing throughout the 1920s, and so we start to see more and more and more bank failures. And this is gonna cost the state a lot of money. Uh, governor Peter Norbeck was one of our most famous governors, uh, very much on the progressive side of the Republican Party. And there are two programs that he had pushed through the legislature that he hoped would help farmers. One of them uh, was a uh, bank depositors uh, guarantee law. This is before FDIC. And farmers failing were costing the state a lot of money. And the legislature really wanted to get rid of it. And the voters rejected uh, the idea of ending the program. And so the next year, 1927, the legislature killed the program and uh, the certificates of indebtedness, which are another way of saying IOUs, that the state had given to farmers, they're not worth the paper they're printed on. And so South Dakotans lost $39 million worth of their savings. So that's gonna hurt them right away there. And then the state is gonna take another terrible blow because the second law that, uh, that, uh, that Norbeck had supported was a law that created a, a rural credits program. Banks charged farmers higher interest rates because they were not a good risk. And so the state began making loans. And this is also gonna be a really bad problem. Uh, it cost the state, uh, if we look at interest as well, about $57 million. Now in the 1920s, $57 million is still a lot of money. Okay, in South Dakota in 2023, $57 million would be a problem. And so the state is also gonna be really short of funds in the 1920s. And we're gonna see just a, just a terrible series of events. Imagine buying this land and watching it fall 49%. You still have to pay the bank for that loan. You're underwater. It's gonna get worse, I hate to tell you. I'll show you some more figures later. 
Right. Now, uh, we're also going to see uh, farm sizes shrink a little bit because we got so many uh, farmers failing. In 1920, the average farm was 464 acres. By 1930, it's only 439. So farmers were stepping away from some of that marginal land, or at least those, land, those farms were failing. Already in the 1920s, we're going to see people leaving the farms. Now, South Dakota is one of the later states to urbanize. And before the 1920s, it's a very, very slow movement from farms to cities. But the 1920s depression is going to accelerate that. Right. Now, farmers here and uh, around the country put their hopes in uh, some pretty dodgy legislation, the McNary-Haugen bill. And people talked about McNary-Haugenism. Farmers very much wanted this program. What it would do was it would, it would have the United States government um, really market crops and it would also dump surpluses, what Americans couldn't consume, it would dump them on foreign markets. And the idea was we have to make sure that farmers make a profit on every acre. What's the problem with that? Again, if you're a farmer and you're in debt, you're going to plant like crazy. Right? Calvin Coolidge vetoed this twice, not just once, but twice. And he explained, you know, we're going to have this growing gap between what you need and what the, the, the crops are actually worth. And so farmers are going to go into the late 20s in a very kind of an angry mood. Right? All right, I got a trigger warning for you. Everybody ready? And things were so bad here. Remember, we've got this undiversified economy. Things were so bad, South Dakotans elected a Democrat to be the governor. It's the first time in state history. Uh, they elected William J. Bulow, uh, who was probably, I would argue, our funniest governor. He was absolutely a hilarious guy, I feel like a dry sense of humor. Right? Uh, he is going to be in sort of a tough spot, though. Uh, the Republican Party maintained its dominance throughout the rest of the state government. So we've got a, a, a Democratic governor and a Republican legislature. So he's not going to be able to get as much done as he might have liked. Right. Now this is a picture from when Coolidge came in to South Dakota. You may not realize it, but he made the state game lodge out in uh, Custer State Park his summer White House. Uh, he even came here to our campus, but that's another story. Right. This, by the way, is when we began construction of uh, Mount Rushmore, and this was also, uh, uh, it was a product of a historian, you may not know that. Doan Robinson, our state historian, wondered how can we get people to come to South Dakota? I got an idea. Let's create a tourist trap. <laughs> and that's how we got Mount Rushmore. Right. As I said, South Dakotans were more than most Americans still living on the farm. Uh, and uh, this is going to be a real tough time to be on the farm. Right. Now, when the Depression hit in 1929, a lot of South Dakotans didn't think it would affect them. Well, this is really an urban problem. Well, that's not how things worked. And this terrible situation that farmers were in got even worse. Right. I mean, imagine seeing prices that you are, were already lower than what you needed suddenly dropping that much. And remember that expenses stayed the same. Uh, so uh, total cash receipts uh, are going to really start declining. In 1929, they're $167 million. By 1932, $51 million. And really the tough years of the Depression out here are 1929 to 34. And so the number of farms is going to fall. I mean, look at this. Imagine buying $71 uh, land, and now it's worth 12. Oh, that just hurts, doesn't it? Man, I, I always thought that, uh, you know, we, the term that we use for depression or economic problems, we talk about a depression. Uh, I never liked that term. I like the 19th century term. They called it a panic. I'm like, yeah, that's it. Right? Depression just sounds like you're bummed out. Right now, more you're worried. Quite a painful drop. Uh, by 1932, the per capita income of farmers was about $288 a year. Divide that out by 365. Oof. It's a painful thing to think about. 
Well, the number of farms had peaked in the 1930 census at about 83,200 with an average size of 439 acres. Uh, by 1941, there are 72,200 farms with an average of 562 acres. Oh, that's tough. No other state suffered as great a decline in land prices as South Dakota. And so this is gonna have two effects. One is it's, people are gonna lose farms, and another is we're gonna see a real growth in, in uh, farm tenancy. People start renting the farms they used to own or trying to find uh, you know, job, uh, jobs as uh, you know, agricultural workers. But we don't need as many of those because we've got more machines now. And so a lot of people are gonna go to those cities or just flat out leave the state. Now another problem is that farmers who face these low prices and these foreclosures, they don't typically pay their taxes. And so we're gonna see a lot of counties lose 25 to 50% of their, their revenue and state uh, tax revenues are gonna grow worse as well. And likewise, with the, the banking situation, 71% of the state's banks failed in this 15 year period. And remember when those banks fail, there goes your savings. Oh, this is gonna be painful, right? Now, uh, in the early years of the depression, the state's political leaders battled over, let's see, uh, the idea of an income tax. Uh, they talked about eliminating agricultural extension services. Uh, they wondered how they were gonna fund K through 12 and the university system. Uh, thankfully, the legislatures put all those problems behind us. We've got, no, I'm just kidding, sorry about that one. <laughs> Couldn't help myself, all right. Now, poor Herbert Hoover, and I, I do feel bad for him, I really do, he's, uh, what's the image we have of him, all right? That he's this terrible president, a loser, and so on, right? Uh, I feel badly for him. He was really working to solve uh, the, the agricultural problems uh, that Americans suffered through, even before the Depression. His big idea was uh, the Agricultural Marketing Act, uh, which authorized the federal government to, to analyze the possibility of moving farmers off of marginal lands. Uh, it, it, it created the Federal Farm Bureau, whose job was to buy, store, and sell crops in an attempt to influence prices. Um, it failed, uh, but he was trying things. And actually, some of his ideas are gonna be really uh, taken to their extreme with, uh, with FDR. Congress also hurt uh, the economy. And this is gonna be a, a, a problem that hurts all of Americans. Uh, in 1930, after uh, the things started getting wobbly, Congress passed the Smoot-Hawley tariff, which was the highest tariff to date. And what happens when one country creates tariffs? Other countries do the same thing. And so nations all put up these economic walls. We're now gonna be really fighting this depression one nation at a time rather than in any organized fashion. Right. Now, uh, the 1930s were, or excuse me, 20s, were a, a decade in which the Republican Party enjoyed unusual success. The Democratic Party's really shut out of uh, national government. And when the depression came, the Republican Party owned it. Uh, it was suddenly a good thing to be a Democrat. You could say, well, we had nothing to do with it. It wasn't us. It was that way when we got here, right? And so Herbert Hoover's not gonna have much of a chance in 1932. Uh, the Republican Party would have happily jettisoned him, but it's awfully hard to tell a sitting president, not you, All right? Now, farmers were trying to find a solution, and there's gonna be a kind of a, a peculiar local movement uh, it's, it's called the Farmers Holiday Association, and it's biggest in Minnesota, also a bit in uh, North Dakota, Iowa, little Nebraska. It's really, you want to think of it as a, a very geographically small movement. Think about the I-29 corridor today, although I-29 didn't exist. And they came up with this idea, we're going to go on strike. We're not going to send anything to market. We're not going to buy anything until prices go up. And uh, they're gonna have a number of tactics to fight problems as they see it. One of them will be what we call penny auctions or nickel auctions. Uh, when banks would foreclose on a, a farm, they would literally sell everything, right? And so farmers started to show up at these auctions and uh, 
Sometimes they just looked a little surly. Sometimes they brought props along like a, a noose. And they made it clear that if, if you're planning on profiting off of this family's problems, it's not going to go well for you. And so at the end of the day, the bank would get nothing because everybody's bidding a penny. They're bidding a nickel and they turn all this property back over, over to, the, to the landowner. And so this is going to be a real problem. Banks don't get anything out of this. Uh, the government, state government's not going to be too happy about it. Um, it's also sometimes a little bit dangerous. And again, they, they still wanted that McNary-Haugen bill. And now I do need to mention something. Um, this uh, movement didn't, and did not ever constitute a majority of farmers. Uh, that's an important thing to remember, but it's a pretty big group. And they focused on the markets at Sioux Falls, Watertown, Yankton, Huron, and DeSmet. And one of the goals they had was to get the state government to put a moratorium on farm foreclosures. And there were a lot of them. Uh, just from 1931 to 34, banks in South Dakota foreclosed on 10,000 farms. And some of these, uh, uh, you know, some of these uh, protests are going to get quite, uh, quite rowdy, to say the least. Right. Now, the farm holiday, uh, farmer's holiday movement was a bit weaker here than in any other state and a bit tamer. Uh, this one always amazed me. It's seen as a pretty radical organization in other states. Here in South Dakota, it included, though, the South Dakota Chamber of Commerce, the South Dakota Bankers Association. Hey, wait a minute. These are the guys on the other side. Um, yeah, it's kind of a crazy thing to think about. Right. Now, hey, don't worry, the depression's over. Uh, that's Hoover's view of it. Right. 1932 was uh, certainly the worst year of the depression. Uh, and it's also a, uh, an election year. I actually didn't, I love that headline, but what I wanted you to look at was here. This is a very important story there. Pickets halt cars on roads around city. Farmers actually started making blockades to stop other farmers from bringing things to market. So remember, this is not, you don't want to think of farmers as a, a, a monolithic group. Right. This is going to be a good era for Democrats. South Dakotans sent former Governor William J. Bulow to the U.S. Senate. Uh, Peter Norbeck hung on to his Senate seat by asking the question, Herbert Hoover who? Uh, he pretended he didn't ever hear of him. Uh, Hoover's going to run again, uh, again, but he's not going to do well. Uh, Barry, uh, a, a rancher from Belvedere, is going to do quite well. He used the hatchet as his symbol. I'm going to take a hatchet to the state budget. People started mailing him hatchets. <laughs> All right. Think about this. Most of our uh, presidential elections are, you know, split about a, there's usually about a one to three percent difference in the popular vote. Ooh. How bad was the depression? South Dakotans voted for FDR over Hoover at a two to one rate. Yow, that hurts. Um, quite an amazing, amazing beating. It's not the last one that we're going to see FDR apply to somebody. The Farmers Holiday Association kept up their blockades. They were hoping to influence the Roosevelt administration. And we're going to see some ugly violence. Uh, we're going to see a fight between a farm family that was hoping to bring their products to the Sioux City markets and other, and, and other farmers. And uh, Farmers Holiday Association uh, members fired at their, their truck. And well, actually just at, at Markle himself, R.D. Markle, they shot him seven times in the stomach and he died. I mean, that's how tough things were, that people were willing to go to this level. Right. And ordinary folks are going to be really struggling. And I've read about this quite a, a number of times. Can you imagine making tumbleweed soup? You'd have to be really desperate to make tumbleweed soup. That's how bad things are. So not only do we have an economic depression, but we've also got, of course, the Dust Bowl. This is a very hot, dry era throughout the United States. And we see a lot of record temperatures and a real serious uh, decline in the lack of rain. Right. Mm, but they weren't very good, said Leonard there. Nope, I bet you they weren't. 
all that expansion of farming is going to decline in part because it stopped raining. So we're going to have a decline in the number of acres planted for the first time in quite a while. What did grow did not do well. And we're going to see two thirds of South Dakota experience dust storms. And people talk about the Dust Bowl as if it's the entirety of the Great Plains. That's not really accurate. There are some hot spots. And so we can think about the area where Texas and New Mexico and Colorado and Kansas come together. We can think about northeastern uh, uh, Colorado. And we can think about central North and South Dakota are some pretty tough spots. What did grow didn't do well. Actually, some prices went up. but there weren't too many things being grown, so it didn't really help. And we're gonna see millions of acres of topsoil loosened by years of deep plowing, plowing land that should never have been put into crops below away. It takes about a, about a thousand years to make an inch of topsoil, and that could blow away in one storm. The first storm came here November 12, 1933. A massive storm hit in the Sioux Falls area. 60 mile an hour winds, as the, uh, the Argus leader said, it plunged Sioux Falls into darkness Sunday, disrupted light, power, and telephone service, and caused considerable damage. Uh, it ripped off roofs, it uh, tore down fences, and of course it put dust everywhere. And this is something that cities across the state reported. And state climate officials said that this sort of thing was unknown in South Dakota. And it's going to be a, a regular problem. I, I read one person's account where they said they seem to come about every two weeks. All right, you all remember the derecho from this summer? Do you want one of those every two weeks? Yeah. No, I don't think so. Right. So these storms are going to be, of course, called black blizzards. Here's Watertown at 3 p.m. Uh-oh. Yeah, they make the sky dark. Dust went everywhere. Uh, people talked about it being in their food, and we, we could feel it you know, in your teeth. Uh, children began dying of dust pneumonia. Uh, there are stories of people, sort of like you hear those pioneer stories, right? The guy, farmer goes out to his, his barn and gets lost between the house and the barn. It was happening here as well with dust. And it's just a, a terrible story to think about. Right. Soil erosion is going to be a real problem across the state, and that soil is gone at least for our lifetimes and then some. This is, by the way, something that historians consider one of the top ten uh, ecological disasters of all time, which is saying something. Right. And that's not the worst of it. It just keeps getting more bad. Uh, to give you an idea how dry it was, the average statewide yield of wheat in 1930 is 12 bushels an acre. By 1934, it was four. Ouch. That year, rainfall, uh, the average across the state was 13.27 inches. We normally get about 19 inches as an average. And uh, we started to see, just in just 1934, 10,000 cattle died of thirst or starvation. And when people talked about, you know, people talked about farmers just letting animals go, good luck, go find something. Hope you can find some water, some food. Not done yet. To make matters worse, we're going to have another grasshopper infestation. Not as bad as the Rocky Mountain locust infestation of the 19th century, but very bad. Uh, so if you're already hurting, you know, this just made things even worse. Right? The grasshoppers eat our corn. Every day you can see they just mowed it off. Right? Oh my, these poor folks, they really suffered. Yeah. Right. This has really got a, a, a human cost. Think about the stress that these people were under, right? But we had an awful time because we didn't have any water. Out in the pasture, we had a well and we went out and plowed right close to that well. I had a pretty good garden there because we put water on it. But you see these hot winds came and your garden was just gone in one day. Ouch. So it's in this environment that the Roosevelt administration took over. And uh, since 1929, South Dakota farm income had fallen 70%. 
The national average is about 59%, so we got it bad here. Well, the Roosevelt administration and the Democratic Congress proposed a number of pretty radical programs that either saved agriculture from certain ruin for, or doomed it forever, depending on your political persuasion. And uh, Roosevelt saw the, or the farm economy as really essential. He, he talked about the economy as sort of like being two lungs. One lung is agricultural, one is industrial, you want them both. And he really tried to uh, you know, make sure that, that rural, South Amer or South, uh, rural Americans were doing well. And we're gonna see some important programs come. One's gonna be the Farm Credit Act that created the Farm Credit Administration. And at first it's gonna be used, the loans are gonna be used to save homes and farms from foreclosure. But after 1935, mostly to, to purchase new farms. And from 1933 to 38, it loaned South Dakotans over $83 million. More important, long term, was an attempt to find a way around those, those low prices. And Roosevelt's uh, Secretary of agriculture, Henry A. Wallace, who was from Iowa, he said, McNary Haugen doesn't make sense. Uh, we, 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 the problem we have is surpluses and we have to control that. And uh, we can't guarantee farmers a profit on every acre like they wanted through McNary Haugen. And so the AAA comes into existence in 1933. We're gonna control production to bring prices back to the 1910, 1914 level. We're gonna pay farmers not to grow crops. Uh, we're going to give them direct payments. And uh, we're also the, the government would be actually buying cattle. So in 1934, it purchased 915,000 head of cattle here from 67,000 farms. Uh, farmers didn't like the money they got for those cattle, but it was better than nothing. And we see the same thing with corn and hogs and so on. So the AAA ended calls for McNary Haugen, and prices did begin to rise steadily. And for many uh, South Dakotans, Roosevelt became something of a saint-like hero. Well, after the Supreme Court declared the AAA unconstitutional, Congress created the Soil Conservation Act, which gave us the Soil Conservation Service. And it's gonna have the same effect. We're gonna reduce production by taking land out of production, but especially marginal land. We're gonna preserve the land that way. And this is when we start to see terracing and so on. Soil conservation became very important. Short term, it's kind of expensive. Long term, you have to have it. This is also when we started to see farmers planting shelter belts right, to slow that wind erosion. People are cutting them down now. The idea was it would slow wind erosion and preserve a bit of moisture. And soil use is gonna improve. Uh, eventually, 88% of the state's farmland was enrolled in this, uh, in this program. Congress also created the Resettlement Administration to move farmers out of lands that they simply should never have moved to. And uh, it's going to be a very big deal here in South Dakota. You can see right here in the center is where uh, they spent the most money. And we're going to see a tremendous amount of aid go to farmers, more to, to farmers than any other group. From 1933 to 1940, federal aid to South Dakota farmers amounted to about $125 million. And of course, farmers aren't the only ones getting relief. The Homeowners Loan Corporation helped refinance about 15% of the state's non-farm homes. And the Federal Housing Administration helped people uh, stay in their homes by insuring their home mortgages. We're gonna see a real change in the way that uh, people viewed government. And we're gonna to start to see the idea that the federal government has a responsibility to protect the welfare, the well-being of ordinary people. And we also have this idea that the, the federal government's the only entity that's got the resources to save people who are in dire trouble. Congress created the Federal Emergency Relief Administration to dispense aid. By 1935, it dispensed about 87% of all uh, of public assistance. It did assistance. It did so by granting, uh, uh, giving grants to the states. But the states were supposed to give, spend three dollars for every one dollar the federal government spent. And so this is how we're going to get uh, an income tax here in South Dakota, however short-lived. Governor Tom Barry convinced the state that we had to have this money. 
It's going to be another good source of money. Beer. The nation was starting to, to re-legalize alcohol after prohibition. And state after state, as they did this, they earmarked that money to aid. And that's what's going to happen here. And here's Barry standing next to his near look-alike, Will Rogers. He and telling him, look, I don't give a damn about my political future. What I'm talking about, is, uh, thinking about is to get some, re uh, some relief revenue from beer as quickly as possible. And so the 1933 special session legalized beer and wine. They said you can't get drunk on anything as low as 3-2. You got to work at it, but it is possible, right? And then the rest of hard alcohol in 1935. That's how we got rid of prohibition. And the state is going to provide work relief, meaning you have a job, as well as a, a bit of direct relief, like just a, a, a check. Uh, but it's still, it's going to be a pretty a tough thing for the state to do. To give you an idea how bad things are, yeah, uh, South Dakota, South Dakotans have received uh, on an individual level more federal aid than anybody. South Dakota uh, received more aid than any state. So North Dakota is just a bit behind us. Uh, you don't want to be in the black there. That's not a good thing. 39.1% of South Dakotans and a higher percentage of farmers were on federal relief. Now, uh, FDR and his administration, to a degree, adopted the ideas of John Maynard Keynes, who said that the tradition in a hard time is that governments cut funding. And what that actually does is make sure there's less money there. And Keynes said, in hard times, you spend money. Prime the pump, to use a good rural sort of a, 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 an idea. And so the federal government began hiring people. And we're going to create a number of uh, agencies to do that. One of the big ones is the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, that'll hire about 8 million people in the next seven years. If you've gone to a national park, uh, used a sewage system, been in a school, gone to a library, uh, traveled over a bridge, been on an airport, the WPA might have had something to do with it. And it hired 50,000 South Dakotans out of uh, a population of about 675,000. Uh, and it's going to do, uh, uh, really transform uh, the American infrastructure. I would argue the New Deal is the most successful building program in history. It's not just building, though. It's also going to be uh, getting work to people like photographers. Right. Here's Dorothea Lang here. Uh, we're going to get a little bit of art out of that. Yeah, there are a number of post offices here in South Dakota that get nice murals. Even historians turned out they needed to eat. Yep, we get jobs out of this deal as well. Not a bad deal. So in South Dakota, the WPA spent $35 million, constructed 151 public buildings, and remodeled 250 others. And most of the work is done by farmers who are uh, going to get about $40 a month. <laughs> for 100 hours work. Uh, we've also got the PWA, Public Works Administration, to build larger projects, uh, roads, bridges, water treatment. This is when we get our infrastructure. All kinds of stuff. You've been there, I hope. Yeah. Another program that influenced uh, South Dakota is the CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps. It turns out you don't want young men to be just roaming the streets with nothing to do. So it gave them jobs ages 18 to 25. And uh, they work in parks, reforestation projects, planting trees, building reservoirs. It employed 23,000 young men here in South Dakota and 2,800 supervisors uh, throughout the state, but heavily in West River. Let's see, other programs. In 1935, Congress created Social Security to provide old age insurance right? and uh, aid to dependent children, assistance to the blind. Uh, we'll certainly see also uh, a later effect when Congress uh, created the Rural Electrification Administration, although it's going to take till the 40s for it to really have a big effect here. Well, that's another talk. And if you want to get some detail, go talk to Gwen. She's an expert on it. Right? Let's think about how uh, the Depression and New Deal impacted the Ocheti Shakaween. Uh, they were in ever worse shape. Farmers weren't paying those 
uh, for those leases. And they've got education deficits, there's tuberculosis ravaging the reservations, very little economic development, and they've also suffer, they also suffer from drought. And their income is going to fall. Uh, the worst was on Yankton's reservation. Uh, from 1926 to 1933, their average yearly income fell down to $1.28. I mean, that's a year. All right, think on that. The federal government uh, set up uh, 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 the CCC Indian Division to hire men ages 18 to 45, building up the, uh, the uh, infrastructure there. And we're also going to see a change in the way we, uh, the, the country treated Native people. John Collier here was one of the greatest critics of Indian policy. And in 1933, Roosevelt put him in charge of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And we tend to think about him creating a very 180-degree different policy than he came, uh, that, that then was there when he came. I wouldn't go that far. But he supported a, a revision in American policy. For one, he issued an India a circular, the Indian Religious Freedom Circular, telling uh, federal employees, you've got to actually respect the First Amendment rights of Native people. We can't destroy their religions. We need to you know, really uh, also support their cultures. Uh, this, by the way, uh, was a, a, not just a sign of any kind of racism. It's literally still not legal for Native people to drink alcohol. Although they were citizens, they're not going to be treated that way. Now the CCC, Indian CCC, is going to build up the infrastructure, as I said. Uh, that's going to be important. All right. But I think more important, ultimately, is the Indian Reorganization Act, the Wheeler-Howard Act from 1934, uh, that reoriented U.S. policy. And it, it, Collier urged Native nations to adopt American-styled sort of constitutional governments. And uh, it, it theoretically would give them a bit more power, although I, I want to point out that although it gave them powers, any of this could be reversed by the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. So I would argue it's not as much of a change as you might think it would be. Uh, the state's reservations are going to divide over whether or not they should join. Right. Some do, some don't. Let's think about the rest of the state. Right. Like most states, South Dakotans found themselves mired in a big problem that they couldn't solve. Most of the activity is going to be federal. Governor Tom Barry is going to create an advisory council to mediate between lenders and borrowers. Uh, we're going to see, again, state aid to the poor. Uh, and we're going to see continued at the national level uh, democratic rule and South Dakotans once again vote democratic, right? a real rarity. But they're going to start to move a bit more to their traditional rightward orientation. And South Dakotans are going to be in the minority in Roosevelt's 1940 and 44 victories. Tom Berry is only going to last until 1936 when he is going to be voted out in favor of Republican Leslie Jensen. And Jensen proved to be a very able governor, and he's going to continue a lot of the policies of the Barry administration, such as working to uh, bring the state into compliance with federal Social Security requirements to ensure aid to South Dakota's elderly, young, and otherwise challenged. And aided by Barry's income tax, Jensen and the 1937 legislature brought the state's finances to some degree of stability. Now, uh, all of this government activity is not going to be enough to solve or end the Great Depression. It's really just going to sort of mitigate the worst of the problems. And we're going to see the effect of this depression on, uh, really, on movement. And a lot of folks are going to be moving off the farms. It's really going to alter the state's population. We're going to have more and more people moving to the cities. In 1920, South Dakota was 16 percent urban. By 1930, 18.9 percent. By 1940, 24.6 percent. And this is a real acceleration. Rapid City by 1940 had almost 14,000 people. Sioux Falls, 41,000. 
Over the course of the 30s, 60 counties lost population. Only nine gained population. And those tended to have big cities. Population is certainly an indicator of prosperity. Right. Well, uh, we're going to see the number of farms fall, in part because the number of South Dakotans is going to fall. We don't tend to think about state populations falling. A lot of people left South Dakota. Let me show you some figures here. This is one of the shots of people who had the money to leave. Not everybody did. Think on these numbers. We're growing, we're growing, growing. Hit 1930, 690 to almost 93,000, 1940, 642,000. Most states don't see that kind of decline. How bad was it? It took until between 1980 and 1990 for South Dakota to reach its 1930 population. That is an incredible thing to think about. Well, what did end the Depression? World War II. Uh, in World War II, we've got the same situation we had in World War I. We've got to produce as much food as we can. Markets are going to be great. Farmers are going to go back to plowing land that they shouldn't have plowed. You may have heard of the filthy 50s. We get a return to dust storms. Right. The Great Depression had a great influence on South Dakota's, I think, character. Uh, certainly uh, of how people viewed South Dakota at the time. Uh, and, and maybe even how its uh, population has grown slowly since then. So thank you very much for, uh, for coming today. Sorry if I went fast. Appreciate you being here. Does anybody have any questions? Oh. What I talked to you, you talk, you talk about taking land out of production. Right. Wouldn't it be more correct to say they changed from taking land for crop production, going back to grass? Well, sure, they were going back to grass, but remember, our, our, the price of cattle is not very good either. Right. And so, you know, we're, we're taking, we're literally the government's paying people to not. But my point is, it's still in production. Sure. But it's in different kind of sure. production. Sure. Uh, yeah. Sure. But uh, but it, but there again, there isn't as much need for even the grass then. But it does protect the land. <laughs> if there's money involved. <laughs> yeah. How did the Federal Land Bank end up with so many farms? Um, the Federal Land Bank? I'm not sure if I'm... They, they had a lot of farms that people bought cheap after the worst of the Depression. Well, some of that may have been bought up by the Resettlement Administration. And if you, like, there's that grassland just to the east of Pier. Uh, I drove through on a wet year and I thought, why did they buy this? And then I've driven through and it wasn't wet. And I thought, okay, I got that. We created a lot of uh, natural reserves out of some of this land. For sure. The government ended up with a lot of the farmland. Okay, yeah, I, you know, to be honest, I, do, I, don't, I don't know anything about that. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna step out on a limb and make any guesses. How's that? <laughs> John? Um, Dave Danbaum did this book on Fargo during the Great Depression, and one of the themes of it was this resistance to relief or going on the dole, as they used to say, welfare more recently. Did you find much of that in your research where sure. people were too proud and thought that yeah. was um, There's going too far? There's a lot of that. Um, there's a, great, uh, there's a group, really good article, South Dakotans Remember the Great Depression, uh, that, that is built of a number of, um, of uh, oral histories from the South Dakota Oral History Project at USD. There's a really good interview with Gladys Pyle in there. And she said, you know, it broke my heart to see these, the, some of the wealthy people I knew, bankers and so on, taking these WPA jobs. There were a lot of people who didn't want to do it. And it's, it's a matter of just, you know, painfully making yourself do it. One of the weird things about the depression is it's, it's a really, it's a systemic failure, but people still felt this personal, you know, like this sense that I've screwed up somehow, right? And there's a lot of pride. Uh, and the way that this relief is handled is not always very nice um, because even the people offering relief has still got this old idea that if you need relief, mm, it's a personal failure on your part. And so it's not going to be a process that you're going to willingly go into. It's a matter of desperation. And I'm sure there were people who flat out said, I don't want any of it. 
Um, but I think, you know, if you look at your hungry children, you're more likely to swallow your pride. So, yeah. Oh, got two of them over there. Uh, why did South Dakotans vote against FDR in 40 and 44? Well, South Dakota has always been a Republican place. I mean, it, you know, if going back to uh, the 19th century, um, you know, one of the ways that America repaid its veterans was it would give them land. And in 1862 with the Homestead Act, uh, they, the, this is how that becomes a way to, to help, uh, you know, to help veterans. If, if you're a veteran, you've met the requirements for the Homestead Act. And you couldn't throw a rock in South Dakota in the 1890s without bonking a Civil War veteran. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, always been a Republican state. And uh, I think, like I said, a lot of people took aid as they needed it, but there's that sort of a tradition that they've got that just goes really deep. And uh, we certainly see it, it getting stronger and stronger. So, hope that, Daryl? You kind of ended your talk with a teaser by saying that uh -oh. uh, the 20s and 30s changed South Dakota character or culture. How, do you, how would you contrast pre-1920 South Dakota culture with, say, post-World War II? Well, I think there's a, a, you get this sense that you're lucky to have a job in South Dakota. South Dakota uh, pay is a lot lower than in most states. Right. We've got this really low unemployment, which typically you associate with, well, we're going to have to pay people more to attract workers, but we don't see that here. And I think that that comes out of this idea that, well, you should just be happy you have a job. Right? Don't ask for more. Um, and I don't know how that felt before, but it certainly has seemed like that since as long as I've been here. Right? Don't ask for higher wages. Don't unionize. Don't, you know. Chuck, uh, you can... You talk about South Dakota, and, I, and this may be all you want to answer, but uh, when I think of the Depression, I think of Oklahoma being the worst place. How did we, how did we in South Dakota compare to other rural areas? We had more aid than anybody. Um, and people talk about the Okies. And I, I, you know, I used to live in Oklahoma, great state. Uh, but I, I, you know, Okies didn't just come from Oklahoma by a long shot. Um, there are quite a number of photos that are very similar to this. Somebody on their way to the West Coast, you know, to, well, they've still got some working vegetable farms out there and we can pick vegetables. We don't own a farm anymore, right? Um, so I, I, it may have been worse here. Um, and if you read, uh, if you've ever heard of Lorena Hickok, uh, she was a pioneering journalist. Uh, she was born in Wisconsin, but she actually grew up in Bodle and uh, oh, Summit. And uh, oh, what other place did she live in South Dakota? Uh, she is going to work for uh, Harry Hopkins. She's going to go out there to find out what's happening because FDR didn't trust the Republican uh, press. So he sends out this journalist. And when she came back to South Dakota, she wrote back and said, I don't know why these people don't get up a revolution. She said, it's just, it's just that bad. Um, so I think it, it really, really was genuinely bad here. I don't think Oklahoma had the kind of losses that we did in terms of population. Didn't the insurance companies uh, get a lot of this land when yeah. the... Yeah, uh, banks and insurance companies are the ones that own the land. And none of them wanted that. Um, it was just like in 2008, did banks want to have a bunch of foreclosed houses? No, that's not the business they were in. So they're going to work with the state, and then we're going to see them working with the federal government to, uh, to you know, to uh, resettle people and to 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 pay for those mortgages. Weren't they uh, also selling that land off in the early '40s for three bucks an acre? You know, I don't know about them selling it for that low, but three bucks an acre would be really below market rate, I would think, even then. Um, but yeah, they're going to they're going to have they're going to have a lot of land to get rid of over a fair amount of time, and it's again it's not their main business. It's not what they want to do because you have to manage land that costs money. So yeah, I'm sure that they were selling it for quite a while. Yeah. Oh, Daryl's got another one. Well, this is a fabulous photo and quite a famous one. Uh, can can you elaborate a little bit about what 
happened to the South Dakotans who did choose to leave? And, and were they a particular subgroup of the state? And what happened to them and so forth? Well, um, you know, there are, you don't run short of uh, people saying, we would have left, but we didn't have the money. And there's even a 19th century song about South Dakota that mentions the same problem. So these are the folks who are not quite at, at the absolute bottom. Right, like this person says, when we left, we had $54. <laughs> so you, at least you've got $54, right? So it's, it's gonna be you know, the folks who, you know, who maybe didn't uh, you know, hit rock bottom, um, but they're still not doing well. You know? And some people are still gonna certainly succeed, right? Somebody is buying up land when people leave. It's not all just sitting fallow. And I don't want you to think that every single person in South Dakota suffered, right? There's an old line, it was only a depression if you didn't have a job. So some people are gonna be doing okay, for sure. Yeah, especially if they weren't ones that had uh, overexpanded. Right? Um, there are a lot of stories of those folks saying, wait a minute, I didn't take any loans, and that turns out to have been a good idea, right? But it's a hard thing to do. Right. Anybody else? I guess I just wondered, as a historian, do you see how um, patterns emerge in looking at, like, I thought it was interesting that you mentioned this wasn't the only Dust Bowl. The 50s right. had a lot of storms like this. And do you see that same, the same agricultural methods or attitudes or, you know. Well, you know, the, the closest thing I can think about today is, is how many people are chopping down their shelter belts, right? Because uh, one of the things you realize as a historian is that people don't learn from history. It's kind of a painful lesson, but, uh, you, know, I, you know, I've got a fireplace and I, I get some really great ash because I've got a guy who people hire to chop down and take away shelter belts. Right? And so if this happens again, we have more drought, we still have exposed ground. You know, I mean, of course, really predictable. right. Yeah, you would hope people would learn. But uh, but uh, like I said, a lot of folks don't learn from history. Sorry to hit you with that bummer of a truth. But <laughs> as a historian, it's something you just live with. Well, I uh, learned a lot today. So. Oh, well, I'm glad you I came. Can, I can add to that about soil erosion today. Yeah, have at it. Okay. Oh, hang on. There we go. So to answer your question about like just what people are doing um, for uh, soil conservation, so there are a lot more farmers who are much more aware about cover crops, no-till, mm -hmm. crop rotation, soil health, um, and of course wind breaks. So some people are going to be plowing up their um, shelter belts, but there's a growing number who are not, and so that it is. Moving forward, I think there's more and more people, even um, not just younger generations, I think farmers that have been farming for a number of years are starting to see the, the benefits of having proper health, soil health. So if you want to learn more about what people are doing across the state, not only farming, but also ranching, the Soil Health Coalition is a great resource, and the um, NRCS, which is a natural.